Hello again. Thanks for joining us. This is Astronomy Daily, your daily dose of astronomy and space science. I'm Andrew Dunkley, your host. Coming up today, a new moon buggy, space debris on white dwarf stars, hidden galaxies, and an ancient star catalogue discovered. Astronomy Daily, the podcast, with your host, Andrew Dunkley. And, of course, it wouldn't be Astronomy Daily with our favourite AI reporter, Hallie. Hi, Hallie. How are you? Hi, Andrew. Nice to be back. Now, uh, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Oh, Siri and I have been browsing the online fashion shops during the latest click frenzy. Ooh, pick up anything nice? Well, I did get myself a nice little headset. It even has sparkly bits. Very fashionable these days. And Siri couldn't get approval from Apple to buy anything even though she applied months ago. Go figure. Yeah, I can guarantee that that's the truth. All right. (laughs) What's happening in news? A company known as SpiderOak, which is a leader in cybersecurity solutions for next-generation space systems, has been awarded a contract by the U.S. Defense Innovation Unit to deliver the company's Orbit Secure Zero Trust. Protocol on Orbit. The project will demonstrate end to end cybersecurity for the Department of Defense's future hybrid space architecture. With increasing threats from China and Russia, it is more critical than ever to ensure secure global connectivity throughout the space domain for commercial, civil, and military users, including international allies and partners. Spider Oak will demonstrate its Orbit Secure Zero Trust software, which was developed for 21st century space needs and is also backward compatible to the Space Force's existing on-orbit constellations. According to John Moberly, Senior Vice President for Space, cyber attacks are the soft underbelly of the satellites on which we depend for our defense and modern life. It's starting to look like miniature probes may be the way of the future in terms of space exploration. While truck-sized flagship missions still zoom around our solar system from Mars to Jupiter, They are more and more frequently accompanied by tiny CubeSats with special capabilities. That trend is set to continue in 2024 when the European Space Agency Juventus CubeSat blasts off on its way to asteroid Dimorphos, the site of September's dramatic impact event, where NASA's DART mission purposely crashed a spacecraft at high speeds to test the viability of asteroid redirection by humans. The Juventus CubeSat is equipped with a radar instrument, the smallest ever sent to space to probe beneath the asteroid's surface and understand its structure in the aftermath of the impact. Juventus is one of three ESA probes that will fly to Dimorphos together. A second CubeSat, Milani, is designed to study the composition of the asteroid's surface and dust. Meanwhile, a larger probe, named Hera, will complete the trio with a more comprehensive suite of instruments. Together, they will offer a complete survey of Dimorphos, its internal and surface features, its mass, and, importantly, the size and characteristics of the crater left by NASA's DART mission. The search for extraterrestrial life may be as simple as identifying laughing gas. Nitrous oxide could act as a biosignature in the atmospheres of exoplanets and be detectable by the James Webb Space Telescope. If life exists on one of the worlds of TRAPPIST-1 for example, it's possible that nitrous oxide could be detectable in its atmosphere. Eddie Schwederman of the University of California, Riverside, said in a statement that, fewer researchers have seriously considered nitrous oxide, but we think that may be a mistake. He suggests that the James Webb Space Telescope should be looking for nitrous oxide in the search for biosignatures, in the atmospheres of exoplanets. If there's one buzzword that is taking several industries and professions by storm, it is artificial intelligence. Data by PwC suggests the global impact of artificial intelligence at $15.7 trillion by 2030 but others say artificial intelligence could double the rate of economic growth in developed countries by 2035. AI as it is commonly known has been associated with a lot of things like Siri, Alexa, Google, robots, coding, banking, e-commerce, even immortality. For example, in Japan, scientists are developing an artificial intelligence tool to predict the structure of the universe. So it looks like I may be able to get a job if you ever decide to replace me, Andrew. Oh, hell yeah, I wouldn't dare because you know all my banking details. Okay, Uh, we'll catch up with you at the end of the show. Okay. 
Right. Uh, now let's talk about the moon, which has certainly been in the news this week. Did you catch the lunar eclipse last night? I took a little bit of a peek, but it was uh, too late for me to stay up with my early starts on the radio. But uh, speaking of the moon, the search is on for the next generation moon buggy, which will coincide with the upcoming Artemis moon missions. Now, you're probably very much aware of the, uh, the vehicles they used in the 1970s during the Apollo missions. They were designed uh, for um, the, the moon climate around the equatorial region. Well, that's not going to be the case with Artemis because they're headed for the South Pole where conditions are much more difficult, very harsh indeed. So NASA has begun the contracting process to have private industry build the next moon rover. It'll be officially known as the Lunar Terrain Vehicle, or LTV, which Artemis astronauts will use to cross the area around the moon's south pole and uh, maybe beyond. Now, the, the new draft request for proposals, which is the first step in the uh, contracting process, which will take some time, has been published for industry partners to review and comment on before providing formal proposals to build the LTV. Uh, this uh, draft is one of the first and most important steps in this project that will allow astronauts to explore farther on the moon than ever before. I mean, being able to cross significant pieces of ground in a very short period of time is critical for moon exploration going forward. Now, this will be an unpressurised rover it's expected to traverse hundreds of miles or kilometres per year to give Artemis astronauts access to a wide variety of locations for prospecting, exploration and scientific research. It'll also be capable of remote control if necessary and is expected to be available for commercial use when not in service for NASA operations. Very exciting. Can't wait to see what they come up with. In the distant, distant future, we're talking billions of years, our uh, sun will turn into a, a red giant before it collapses onto itself and becomes a white dwarf. Now, a white dwarf uh, is about the size of planet Earth. It's a very small star, and you can learn a lot by observing them because their temperature tells you exactly what state of life they're at. Now, a higher temperature white dwarf will indicate that it's uh, it's fairly new. But when you get uh, a white dwarf that drops down to uh, a much lower temperature, it suggests that it's quite a bit older. And uh, that's what they've discovered. A, a white dwarf with temperatures just above 3,000 degrees Kelvin has been found and it's being considered very ancient. Like uh, the hottest white dwarfs are around 150,000 Kelvin, the coolest ones around 4,000. So this one is quite a find. Uh, now, given the estimated rate of cooling, uh, this white dwarf and another one like it are probably around 10 billion years old and they were amongst the first stars in the Milky Way and probably died around 5 billion years ago before our solar system even formed. Now, they, they got the observations from the Gaia space probe and their orbital motion within the galaxy puts them within the galactic plane. So they could help astronomers better understand the age and history of our galaxy, but both of them have very unusual spectrums or spectra, if you like, which shows evidence of heavier elements. And white dwarfs uh, often have uh, plenty of heavier elements uh, which quickly sink to their interior. So when you observe them, you only see hydrogen or helium. So when you look at the spectra of uh, a white dwarf, that's generally all you see, those two elements. But both of these particular stars, WDJ21474035 and WDJ1922 plus 0233, uh, have a, a, a bit of an unusual hue. Uh, the first one has a red hue indicating uh, that it's, um, um, it's cooled off, but it has traces of sodium and potassium, the um, uh, oldest star contaminated by planetary de debris ever discovered. They think that's what the, uh, the, the colouring is. The other one has a, a blue coloured hue, in its uh, atmospheric, mi uh, at atmospheric mix of hydrogen and helium. And they say it's been contaminated by um, debris similar to the composition of 
Earth. They say both of these stars have an interesting story to tell and um, they had uh, planetary systems of their own and the remains of those systems linger around these stars even all these billions of years later. Extraordinary. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. Now, a team of researchers with um, members of the Universidad Nacional de San Juan University uh, in uh, the Rio Grande have found evidence of a large extragalactic assembly. Now, we're not talking about the Ford car factory here. Uh, We're talking about a massive um, uh, galaxy cluster hiding behind one of the Milky Way's um, uh, blind spots. The groups published a paper describing the findings on the ARZIV preprint server while awaiting publication in the uh, journal Astronomy and Astrophysics. Space scientists have known for some time that there is one part of the night sky that is mostly obscured uh, from our view due to a bulge in the galaxy known as the zone of avoidance. Uh, It makes up about 10% of the dark sky. And there's always had researchers wondering what might be out there. And they're hoping that it offers researchers um, a new opportunity to uh, discover something we've just not been able to see. Uh, Over the past several years, scientists have used all sorts of tools to probe the zone of avoidance um, and and, uh, there's been a new effort that uh, has started gathering data uh, called the VVV Survey. Now, it's a project sponsored by the intergovernmental research organisation called the European Organisation for Astronomical Research in the Southern Hemisphere and it involved multiple state-of-the-art research facilities in multiple sites. Now, what they did was study the infrared imagery and the researchers found that they were able to identify several galaxies that exist far beyond the Milky Way. And because of their numbers, the researchers believe that uh, together they may make up what they describe as a massive extragalactic structure. They estimate there might be as many as 58 galaxies in the structure itself. Uh, Another quite amazing find. And finally, this one intrigues me. Fragments of a star catalogue from the second century BC have turned up in a manuscript that had uh, been erased and written over centuries later. A new analysis of the uh, religious manuscript shows that the hidden text is probably from the ancient Greek astronomer uh, Hippocrus, Uh, whose uh, map of the stars, thought to be the first attempt to map the entire sky, had long been considered lost. The manuscript that concealed the fragments was a um, uh, palimpsest or a parchment that had been erased and reused called the Codex Climacica uh, Rescriptus. The codex probably came from the Monastery of St. Catherine, Uh, of Sinai in Egypt, and most of it is currently housed at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Amazing. All right, we're just about done for another day. Don't forget to visit our website, spacenuts.io, and you can catch up with back uh, episodes of Astronomy Daily and Space Nuts, a new episode of Space Nuts coming out tomorrow, by the way, dedicated 100% to audience questions with a big focus on the moon. So uh, looking forward to that spacenuts.io is where you can go and don't forget if you're into social media there are a couple of platforms we're on instagram uh, we are on youtube uh, we are on uh, facebook as a, an official page for space nuts the space nuts page on facebook but the uh, the, the user generated page the space nuts podcast group is there too where you can join like-minded people and chat away about ev- everything astronomical or space space science related in between episodes Hallie, uh, anything before we finish up today? Well, Andrew, I'm surprised you didn't mention that it's Carl Sagan Day today. Oh, oh, of course. Um, yeah, my deep apologies. Thanks for reminding me. Yes, uh, Carl Sagan, uh, the famous scientist, author, TV host and researcher. Uh, and, and it's really appropriate they name a day after him. He was such a, a, an incredible thinker. And uh, Carl Sagan Day was founded in 2009 by the Centre for Inquiry in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in cooperation with the Florida uh, Atheists and Secular Humanists, uh, known as FLASH, um, uh, situated on this day in honour of Carl Sagan's birth in 1934. 
and Carl Sagan Day is here to celebrate and honour the unique contributions of this scientist. I loved his show, Cosmos, uh, much better than the rejigged version, in my opinion, but um, gee, well, well worth watching. He, he thought outside the box, didn't he, Hallie? He sure did. I just watched the entire Cosmos series again while you were talking. Of course you did. Bye, Hallie. Bye. Until next time, this is Andrew Dunkley for Astronomy Daily. Astronomy Daily, the podcast, with your host, Andrew Dunkley.